So you're having breakfast at home and wave at the passengers of a plane passing by your house. Ah, another one. You live on the 739th floor of Exceed 4000. It's an entire city contained in one massive skyscraper. It sounds unrealistic right now, but one day it may become a reality. So let's see what we'd need to make it happen. But first, let's browse through the list of once tallest constructions on the planet. The Great Pyramid of Giza, originally standing at 481 feet, used to be the tallest structure ever built by humans for over 3,800 years. The Lincoln Cathedral took this title away from the Great Pyramid only in 1311, winning by just one foot. Then, the Washington Monument became the new champion. As people were starting to use steel more and more, the Eiffel Tower became the tallest construction in the world. Then followed the Empire State Building. It didn't keep the title for long, with more and more skyscrapers built across the world. Let's fast forward from here to the current record holder, the Burj Khalifa. It has 163 floors and stands twice as tall as the Empire State Building and around three times taller than the Eiffel Tower. On a clear day, you can see it from a distance of 60 miles. It takes a whole one minute in a high-speed elevator to get from the ground floor to level 124, where one of the observation decks is located. It took six years to finish this beauty, which became one of the symbols of Dubai. Speaking of its location, if you've ever tried building something in the sand, you know how hard it is to make the construction stable. The engineers had to drill 192 holes under the 110,000-ton concrete foundation of this massive construction. They also brought millions of tons of sand from Australia. Yes, they brought extra sand to the desert because the local sand gets doughy, almost like snow, in endless dust storms. The Australian sand is less smooth and has turned into a perfect base for the building. Thanks to the friction between concrete and soil, these piles don't move at all, and the foundation remains solid. Now, the same architect designed another building that is supposed to become the new record holder. The Jeddah Tower in Saudi Arabia is supposed to be almost 600 feet taller than Burj Khalifa. Once finished, the construction, made of 80,000 tons of steel, will host the world's highest observatory. Jeddah Tower will have 59 elevators, and some of them will be double-decker ones. The bottom third of the skyscraper is supposed to be office spaces. The next levels will host a luxury hotel, and the remaining 167 floors will be reserved for apartments. The narrowing silhouette of the building is supposed to help it withstand winds and gravity. The base will definitely be extra wide to make the entire construction stable. Only one third of the building has been finished so far, and construction has been frozen for an unknown period of time. The reasons for this decision don't have to do with geology or climate. Humans have learned to deal with all kinds of soils and conditions. For example, if we want to build our future skyscraper in a seismically active zone, we'd need to make it flexible. Piles can hold the weight of the building, but the concrete pad would stand on huge springs. During an earthquake, the ground will shake and move from side to side. But the springs will dampen and compensate for the movement. So, the building will stay in place. The wind is another problem for skyscrapers. The taller the building, the more the wind's affected. That's why most skyscrapers are built to be able to sway in the wind or have holes to allow the wind to pass through instead of crashing against the building surface. So, in theory, if you have the right materials and enough funding, you can go as tall as you want. All you have to do is expand the base to make your construction stable. Now, because our planet is spherical in shape, you'd have to stop at some point. But even a base of that size would be enough to hold a skyscraper higher than Mount Everest itself. Exceed 4,000 building would stop halfway in that race, at a height of 45% of the world's tallest peak. Mount Fuji became the inspiration for this design that might actually be built in the Tokyo Harbor. It will be a self-contained city in one building, powered mostly by solar energy. This city can become home to up to 1 million people. And these people might not have to leave their huge home, as there will also be offices inside. Engineers will need to work out several issues to make the whole project possible. 
Since the building will have 800 floors, there will be a huge difference in air pressure between the top and the bottom levels. They'll need to figure out a way to level it out so residents feel comfortable and healthy. Then, just imagine the number of power cables to enable the work of all the gadgets and mechanisms. They plan to replace those with renewable energy generators. The base of the building will have to be about 4 miles in diameter to support its huge weight. It's the same size as the bottom of some mighty mountain. The opening on the top will let some air and natural light flow inside and lighten the load on the foundations. Exceed 4000 currently holds the title of the largest building that has ever been fully designed but is not on the list of buildings to be completed in the near future. Engineers don't rule out that with new materials and design innovations, it may be technically possible, but it would cost a lot of money. Another ambitious project that is so far just a concept is a 12.4-mile skyscraper. That's 24 Burj Khalifas put on top of each other. Wow! Science fiction author Neil Stevenson, who developed the project, suggested using this skyscraper as a liftoff ground for rockets. The author studied physics before taking up science fiction, so the project could be realistic with the right high-grade steel. Stevenson claimed it would be the cheapest way to launch rockets into space. The engineers would also have to take care of the winds that get pretty intense at a height like this. Speaking of space travel, we might not even need rockets to go up there in the not-too-distant future. The space elevator could take humans up to an altitude of 22,000 miles from the Earth's surface. The idea is actually nearly 150 years old. Both NASA and researchers from different countries agree we're now pretty close to its realization. Some construction companies claim they can build it by 2045. The first big step towards that goal is to test how an elevator would act in space. It will be a unique experiment, and a mini elevator used in it will be a prototype of the future grand project. Scientists are trying to find the right material to replace the regular cable. It would need to extend for tens of thousands of miles and would be too heavy for the future construction. It looks like an ultra-strong material known as graphene could do the job. Testing and building the elevator fit for space and a cable strong enough to hold it is one side of the story. Another problem is space debris. Those pieces of rockets and spacecraft orbiting the Earth that could damage the construction if they run into it. But since many bright minds are working to solve this problem, we can be optimistic about it and expect the first launch several years from now. It will open up a whole new era of space exploration, as going up there will become a matter of pushing just one button. Woohoo! Most of Europe's skyscrapers are concentrated in five cities. Those are London, Frankfurt, Paris, Moscow, and Istanbul. But even combined, all these places have fewer skyscrapers than New York City alone. For a building to be considered a modern skyscraper, it has to be about 490 feet high, which means it should have at least 40 to 50 stories. A story is simply one floor of a building with an average of 14 feet from floor to ceiling. If you had visited the U.S. just before the 1870s, you'd have found only one skyscraper. The home insurance business in Chicago was the world's first high-rise building with 10 floors. Wow! In Europe, the first skyscrapers appeared in Moscow. They were called the Seven Sisters, but they were built only in the mid-1900s. North America started to construct more and more high-rise buildings. It happened because cities were getting too populated. Every piece of land was too valuable. New York's skyline is so famous, you'd probably recognize it even if you've never been to this city before. It's the same for Paris. But could you imagine the Eiffel Tower surrounded or even blocked by skyscrapers? It would surely lose some of its magic. La Défense District is where you'll find skyscrapers in Paris. This way, they don't interfere with the romantic and touristic scenery of the city. In London, things are done a bit differently. Some of its skyscrapers have unusual shapes. One of such constructions is the gherkin. If you get stuck in this building, you'd really be in a pickle. Another interestingly shaped skyscraper is the shard. There's one more nicknamed the cheese grater. These are not their official names, of course, but they do make sense if you look at the shape of these buildings. But it's not some random architectural concept. The reason the skyscrapers are shaped like this is not to obscure St. Paul's Cathedral, 
By the way, the top of this monumental construction is visible even from King Henry VIII's mount, and that's a great distance away. Anyway, there are also other sites, like the Tower of London and the Palace of Westminster. They have their own viewpoints. So, not to ruin London's skyline, it's not allowed to build anything that would block these monuments. Most European cities already existed when the US started to build its first skyscrapers. That's why they didn't have much space to fit in giant buildings. Evenly zoned cities were the result of their steady growth throughout the years. For example, in Lisbon, there's a viewpoint in Eduardo Setmo Park. From that point, you can see all the park and the river. If suddenly there was a bunch of 490-foot-tall buildings standing around, this gorgeous view would be totally ruined. You wouldn't see the iconic avenue and forget the river. Instead, there are buildings. Like Lisbon, many other cities in Europe don't want skyscrapers to spoil their cultural heritage. Take Germany. Most of their skyscrapers are in Frankfurt. In other cities, they'd rather protect and restore the buildings that are already standing. And even if, let's say, Berlin wanted to home some skyscrapers, it wouldn't be able to do it in any case. Its soil just wouldn't allow it. Put a skyscraper there, and it'll sink. Constructing a foundation for a very tall building in Berlin would mean investing a lot of money. The soil's too sandy and soft. But what if you ignored all the cultural heritage and still decided to fill a European city, like Prague, with skyscrapers? First, you'd have to demolish a lot of what already exists there. This would lead to an angry crowd of people complaining that the city they know and love is gone. Brussels has experienced this to a certain extent. There's even a term for this phenomenon, Brusselization. Simply put, it means not caring where you place new high-rise buildings. Here is fine. Oh, sprout one over there, too. Hey, we could call them Brussels sprouts. Or not. But in most cases, city authorities don't want new constructions to change the historical appearance of the place. Some large European cities might even follow France's example and choose a separate district, a place just for skyscrapers. The Burj Khalifa, which is more than 2,700 feet high, is the tallest building in the world. It wasn't an easy feat to construct it. The skyscraper took six years to build, and folks say it was worth the effort. The construction is so tall, you can see it from 60 miles away on a clear day. The tallest building in Europe is only half that size. The Loch de Center in St. Petersburg is a bit more than 1,500 feet tall. Well, the question is, if skyscrapers are so tall, why don't they get knocked over by wind? Their structure, from the very foundation to the highest point of the building, is the answer. Take the Burj Khalifa, please. The soil where the skyscraper is built isn't ideal. So, beneath the 110,000-ton concrete foundation of this massive construction, there are 192 piles driven to a depth of more than 160 feet. Thanks to the friction between the concrete and soil, these piles don't move at all, creating a solid foundation. But most skyscrapers are built on bedrock because it barely shifts. Their frames are made of steel. If you looked at a skyscraper without its external structure, woo, all you'd see would be a bunch of steel beams. The taller the building, the more the winds affect it. Taming them is one of the biggest challenges skyscrapers have to tackle. Imagine you're on one of the top floors of a skyscraper. Suddenly, a strong gust of wind hits the building. The entire construction starts wobbling, and you can feel it even inside. You might even get knocked over if you don't grab onto something. To avoid such a situation, most skyscrapers have a pendulum-like structure inside. It absorbs some of the wind's force. This thing is called a tuned mass damper. The mechanism acts as a counterweight. When the skyscraper gets hit by the wind, it's the tuned mass damper that moves instead of the building. Some high-rise constructions don't need this pendulum. The Shard, for example, deals with the wind with the help of its tapered shape, and Shanghai Tower uses its 120-degree twist. Both skyscrapers have incredibly smart structures. That's why they don't get too wobbly when the wind hits them. The Shard doesn't have a tuned mass damper whatsoever, and the one in Shanghai Tower only serves as a tourist attraction. Before a building's design is finalized, it normally undergoes a wind tunnel test. A model city is built and tested with this new super-tall addition. When the experts turn the wind on, it simulates real-life conditions. Let's say the model skyscraper breaks under the wind's pressure during the test. Then the chances are it's going to tumble over in real life, too. Winds up there can be so strong that things like wind turbines have become a thing. The Bahrain World Center has three of them right in the middle of the building. But there are some others. Strata SE1, for example, has wind turbines at the top. 
There's a phenomenon called the downdraft effect. It's accelerated winds near the skyscraper. When a powerful gust of wind hits a high-rise building, it gets pushed upward around the sides of the construction and down toward the street. That's why if you're passing by a particularly tall building on a windy day, you might have to force your way around. But let's say several square corner skyscrapers are built next to each other. Then they're likely to channel the wind through the streets. This can create many hurricanes on especially windy days. A study once examined 100 tallest buildings that were about to be dismantled by their owners. It turned out most of them had an average lifespan of a mere 42 years. But some of them can last much longer. For example, the Temple Court building is still standing to this day. At 150 feet, it's a bit smaller than others. But it's already seen 100 winters throughout its life. Now, the first thing that comes to mind when you think of getting rid of a building is dust, debris, and deafening noise. (coughs) But things aren't quite as dramatic as that for most skyscrapers. When you want it gone, you take it apart, bit by bit. This process starts from the top and goes all the way down to the bottom. Voila! The building is slowly disappearing in front of your eyes. Abracadabra. Have you ever seen a skyscraper that can change its shape? The creators of the F&F Tower in Panama City had a concept and only $50 million, which isn't a lot in skyscraper money. So they couldn't afford a mistake, and they finished a concrete structure with the 39 upper floors rotating 9 degrees around an axis from the first attempt without spending any extra time or materials. Dubai's rotating tower will look different every time you see it once it's finished. Each of its 80 floors will rotate 360 degrees individually around the center of the building. The lucky residents will be able to control that rotation, which means they can choose their view from the window. A complete lap should take about 90 minutes. And no, the tower won't be a huge waste of electricity. It will produce its own energy. Wind turbines between the floors will drive the rotations. If you've ever wanted to live inside a video game, book an apartment in the King Power Mahana Khan building. This pixelated skyscraper around the height of the Eiffel Tower is the tallest building in Thailand. The secret behind its looks is the horizontally and vertically divided glass windows. It took five years to finish this beauty with over 200 apartments, a hotel, luxury shops, restaurants, and one of the most breathtaking viewpoints in the world. The Libyan International Building features one of the world's tallest artificial waterfalls running right down its side. No worries, they only turn it on on special occasions, and it uses a mix of recycled tap water and rainwater. When it started running for the first time, the non-informed locals even reported a huge water leak. The Cyber Texture Office Building in Mumbai looks like a huge egg made of glass and steel. It was actually inspired by a vessel that, like our planet, has its own ecosystem. To bring down the heat levels inside, the architects chose the ideal orientation and added sun shading and an underground cooling system. The Marina Bay Sands in Singapore seems like a Stonehenge look-alike, but its architect claims that he was inspired by a house of cards. The horizontal one is balanced on the three vertical ones, They are three 55-story hotels with restaurants, nightclubs, gardens, shops, museums, and movie theaters. The horizontal card is an infinity swimming pool with the best view of the city for up to 4,000 visitors. The pool hangs at the height of the 57th floor, and it feels like nothing is holding it. The dancing house definitely stands out among the more traditional architecture in Prague. The nickname for the house is Fred and Ginger. The stone tower symbolizes the famous dancer Fred Astaire, and the glass tower, his partner, Ginger Rogers. There's even imaginary hair on top of Fred's tower. 99 concrete panels support the dancing shape, all of them of different dimensions. Umeda Sky Building, twice the height of Big Ben, consists of two towers of glass and steel to the north of Osaka Station. The floating garden observatory connects the towers on top. Although the building is in a huge city, the skywalk is so high in the clouds that the only thing you'll hear up there is the wind. If you're scared of heights, you can visit an urban garden, a theater, an art museum, 
or one of the many offices closer to the ground inside the building. Architect Octavio Mendoza owns probably the largest piece of pottery in the world. If you're ever in Colombia, ask the locals for directions to the Flintstone House. Yes, they call it that for a reason. The official name is Casa Terracotta, and the architect only used clay to build it. He let it bake and harden in the sun, which transformed the pliable material into solid ceramic. Every curve of the building is designed after the surrounding hills. All the furniture inside is also made of clay. Mendoza is determined to work on the casa for the rest of his life. Artists Dennis Sullivan and Francis Conklin have been saving money for 15 years, carving smaller wooden dogs to create their dream project. The Dog Bark Park Inn in Cottonwood is a 12-foot beagle that stands proud in the Idaho prairie. There is a bedroom and a living area in its body and an extra bedroom in the head. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be inside a huge carpet? Eh, me neither. But checking out the Azerbaijan National Carpet Museum is definitely worth it anyway. It shows the history of this important local craft in every detail. Austrian architect Franz Jans designed the construction, and it took six years to finish it. The basket building in Ohio looks exactly like a real shopping basket, except it's 160 times larger. It even has two attached handles. The building served as the headquarters of Longa Burger Basket Company, then was sold to become a luxury hotel. A giant whale? An airship? Can you guess what's inside this building in Graz, Austria? Two British architects won the Europe-wide competition to design this art museum. The biomorphic construction has around 1,000 acrylic glass elements on its skin. During the night, it can send light signals and messages to people on the other side of the river. It takes in daylight from the north through nozzles on its top. The needle is a viewing platform. The Half House in Toronto, Canada was built in the late 19th century and was one of six identical houses standing next to each other. When developers came to this area, the owners of all the other houses agreed to move. And this one wouldn't go. A demolition crew showed some impressive skills as they managed to tear down the neighboring house without doing any damage at all to what is now the half house. The white exterior wall used to be load-bearing, dividing the neighbors' bedrooms and living rooms. One wrong move of the excavator and the entire construction would become ruins. The shell house in Isla Mujeres, Mexico stands by the ocean, was inspired by the ocean, and looks like one of the ocean's symbols. The house is shell-shaped and covered with shells from nearby beaches. Architect Eduardo Ocampo designed this beauty as he wanted to have a one-of-a-kind house for his brother to come and visit more often. Now it's up for rent for vacationers. The Bubble Palace, not far away from Cannes in France, was designed by a Hungarian architect and purchased by Pierre Cardin. In case you have a couple of spare million, you can buy this interesting property. You'll get 10 bedroom suites decorated by contemporary artists, gardens, water ponds, a swimming pool, and a 500 seat outdoor auditorium with an awesome view of the Bay of Cannes as a bonus. Can you find one house standing straight here? I know, I also failed. All the cubes in the cube house in Rotterdam are tilted 45 degrees at their side. The idea here was to make the most of the space. Dutch architect Piet Blom designed the houses in the late 70s to look like an abstract forest. Each triangular roof represents a treetop. The houses stand at three floors tall with an entrance on the ground floor, an open kitchen, and a living room on the first floor, as well as a bathroom with two bedrooms on the top floor. The Boot in Tasman, New Zealand is a hotel that looks like it comes straight out of a children's book. It even has legit shoelaces. There's a spiral staircase, cozy fireplace, kitchenette, and a bedroom with a balcony. If you ever find yourself in Mitchell, South Dakota, be sure not to miss out on their key tourist attraction, the Corn Palace. The locals have always been so proud of prairie gold that they first built a palace out of corn back in 1892 to prove to the rest of the world how fertile their lands are. 
What you can see now is the rebuilt version. Every year, they put new corn in 13 shades to form new beautiful murals.